Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, I'm Taylor, Dr. Taylor Burrows. I'm a retired mental health counselor and retired marriage and family therapist. And I now work as a coach, consultant, and matchmaker. Today I wanna to talk a little bit about trust. Now, how do you build trust and how do you break trust? And basically how this applies to a lot of different types of relationships, but specifically a romantic relationship, but also I wanna talk a little bit about how it relates and applies to a coaching relationship because trust is so important in the process of coaching. And I find that oftentimes with clients who struggle with trust in general as a behavior, it makes it very difficult uh, to have that attachment even in a learning sense with a coach. And part of that process is an experience of reconfiguring your relationship with trust as you go through the coaching process. And there are gonna be some ups and downs, but ultimately my job is to help you through so that you do learn better behaviors about how to trust, when to trust, and what to expect um, if there are little hiccups along the way. So it's about conflict resolution, problem solving, and attachment in general, but also just figuring out how to communicate best because it's complicated. So in regards to relationships, trust is such a valuable, precious entity, right? Like building trust should happen over time, consistently and gradually. Now, you do have to take certain things for granted. When you're meeting someone, obviously if you're vetting and you're using my system, you're going to be establishing if they're a good person, if they're happy, if they're healthy, if they have a good character, and that should be demonstrated by their consistent behavior. So as long as you don't have any reasons not to trust them, and you kind of know that they're a good person from a good background and uh, they have their own secure attachment that they're bringing to this getting to know you scenario, ultimately a relationship, then you need to give them the benefit of the doubt and trust them. So trust is something that you have to give more to get in return and demonstrate it freely, right? Like you don't want to assume someone is a bad actor and treat them like they've done something wrong when they haven't. That's just a self-fulfilling prophecy waiting to happen. So in that case, trust is something that needs to be capable. You need to be capable of that in your character. It has to be something learned in your background from a stable experience, whether it was parents or caregivers or previous relationships, you should be coming to the table a securely attached adult. And so you're going to carry that secure attachment into a new relationship and it's going to create stability and security between you and the other person. So that trust that you're giving freely just comes from being an above board, honest person who is pretty straightforward and doesn't have any, you know, deceptiveness about her or him. And you're basically, you're not necessarily like an open book, but you're pretty straightforward and transparent. So you may be a little bit reserved and you may have layers that need to get peeled back over time, which is totally appropriate, but ultimately you're going to be able to be taken at face value, right? So with that being said, you expect that in return. Now, if you don't see the signs of that demonstrated back to you, if you don't see that reciprocated, then it's something that you need to be wary of. So you don't want to be naive, but you do want to be able to go on good faith, right? So you give the trust, assuming they're a good actor and you're a good actor. And then over time, that trust is reinforced and developed, it's built because you see how that person responds in stressful situations, in difficult situations, in conflict. Um, they're always showing up, they're always transparent, they're able to confront issues and the difficult conversations head on without hiding or deceiving. And even though they have their own self-interests, they're able to consider you as well and what your preferences are, not even just needs, but your preferences. So they don't manipulate and they don't try to shy and avoid 
things that they don't like just because they don't want to deal with it. So they'll do things even when they don't want to do it because it's for the betterment of the relationship and perhaps just benefits you as a partner that they love, right? So that's basically how you develop trust uh, in a relationship. And the way that it gets broken, it, it's, it's quite scary, right? Because it takes so much time to build up that it only takes one really traumatic infraction to tear it all down. And so you definitely want to do what you can to be conscious day in and day out, not that you need to walk on eggshells, but you want to be very mindful that you're constantly contributing to uh, the merit of the relationship, the trust in the relationship, that good faith needs to be sustained and maintained and reinforced, right? So you need to know whenever you're choosing to react or you know, if you're going to choose to do something for you, you have to consider the other person's role in your life. And when you do that, it's a nice checks and balances of preventing anything that would feel like a betrayal. Um, and it could be a little betrayal, which is just you knew that I wouldn't like that, but you did it anyway. And maybe it's not like a big deal. But if you do something major, that could be the end of it. Uh, that person could have such a strong boundary about trust and fidelity or, you know, any kind of um, infraction of someone doing something knowingly against another person's interests or wishes. So unless you are coming from a position of insecure attachment, right? And this is what I wanted to really bring up because it's so important and I see it playing out often. When you come from a place of, it's almost like desperation or codependence, people pleasing, or you come from a place of like anxious ambivalence or anxious avoidant uh, secure atta or insecure attachment, then what happens is like this hot and cold dance, right? One person is going back and forth hot and cold and the other person is kind of, you know, trying to appease them and make them feel safe and secure. They see it as sort of this moralistic position where they're being the good person, Mr. Nice Guy, or it could be in the, in the reverse if the sexes are flipped. And so that is not, it's not a healthy relationship to trust where you feel like it's disposable. Like you can just, you know, go against trust, <laughs> even if it's, you know, kind of a small thing. It's not like infidelity or some kind of huge major lie or deception. But, but that's not unconditional love. That's codependent love. So you need to be very careful not to basically justify that behavior because you feel like it makes you a good person. It doesn't. It makes you not only a weak person, but it makes you a, a little bit manipulative, right? So you're not being honest to yourself, but also to the person about what you need. You're not teaching them how to trust and how to reciprocate that trust, you're basically just being permissive about anything they do. And, and again, that's not unconditional love, that's codependent love. It's so easy to break trust. After all that work that you've done to build it, if you take it for granted and if you lose sight of contributing to the trust consistently, then depending on how sensitive someone's boundaries are and standards and expectations, their deal breaker could be disloyalty or a breach of trust or deception. Even if it doesn't seem like a big deal to you, it's your, your lack of consciousness about how it affects them that is the real problem. And so obviously if it's accidental, if it's something that you can resolve and fix consciously, then that's different. But you have to demonstrate that you've learned how to change your behavior and you understand empathically the other person's position and build back that trust and that you're able to reciprocate going forward in a way that benefits both of you, right? Because trust can't be one directional. It has to go both ways and you have to see it um, consistently. Now, if there is infidelity or some major deception, 
then that's going to be a traumatic impact in the relationship. You're going to have to go through extensive coaching or clinical um, processes in order to fix that, right? You can't usually fix it on your own because nobody's really objective. So having someone who's an advisor from the outside help you and guide you and play that objective role is really important to getting you into a position where you can move forward. But if it's not such a significant trauma to the relationship, a breach of trust, then you can redirect and you can rebuild because it's not about a real lack of care for the other person. It's really just like an incidental thing that you need to apologize for and you need to demonstrate empathy and the behavioral change going forward, right? Because you prioritize the other person's feelings, basically, or, you know, that you want them to feel prioritized and, and that their, um, their beliefs, their thoughts, their standards are something that you align with and you want to please them. And obviously this goes both ways. But in general, when it comes to trust and how trust is broken, it's not something that breaks down gradually as much as it is built up gradually. So when that first opportunity happens, well, I want you to see it as an opportunity when there is a little insignificant, accidental infraction of trust so that you can learn by example how it applies and how to prevent that miscommunication or that misunderstanding going forward. So it should, once you resolve it, it should be like a, like a binding force that makes you even stronger. If that doesn't happen, it can be like the chink in the armor, that crack that just grows. And then the next time it could just really shatter the entire thread that's holding you together. And I hate to see that. So it's, it's really important that you maintain the systems that contribute to strong trust in a relationship. That's communication, that's honesty, transparency, it's being kind and it's being conscious of what makes them happy, of what's healthy for the relationship because we're not always meeting the other person's needs specifically or directly. It's more that we're meeting the needs of the relationship. There are going to be some needs clearly that are specific to the person that only you can meet, like their sexual needs. But ultimately, other than that, like people don't have needs that they can't meet themselves. But number one is keeping that relationship top priority in your life. And as long as you are are doing that consciously, then you're not going to be neglecting the trust and the communication and the honesty, the transparency and prioritizing the relationship comes first uh, because basically it benefits you in the long run anyway. The happier and healthier the relationship is, the more content you're going to be as well. Because so I did have a little technical difficulty here, so I'm just gonna finish this off with the voiceover. Trust is a really integral part in any long-term relationship, and it's better to build it up right from the beginning so that you don't have to do damage control later and repair lost trust. But undoubtedly, people are human and there's going to be things that come up. So just make sure that you develop that resilience to any type of mistakes or mishaps along the way. You also have to have patience and grace and forgiveness in your relationship as long as both people are pulling their weight and contributing to that rebuilding of trust. One person should not be left holding the bag. Hopefully this was a helpful video for you today, so please like below, subscribe to the channel, and leave your comments and questions as well. Talk to you soon. Ciao!